Welcome everyone. Thank you again for joining today. My name is Bridget Tran. I'm the Chief Digital Strategist at the Transformation Group, um, formerly at Nobu Hospitality overseeing their digital and in innovation. I would like to welcome you to our sixth episode of the International Luxury uh, Hotel Association webinar series. Um, today we're going to be talking about synergy between digital, branding, revenue management, and sales, and I will be your moderator. We have a great uh, lineup of panelists today. Uh, we have Jackie, Jacqueline uh, Riley. She is the Senior Director of Brand and Communication for Premier Worldwide Marketing, representing Charisma Hotel and Resorts. We also have Gabriella Telpa. She's actually sitting in Italy right now, um, and she is the Director of distribution and revenue management for Nobu Hotels. And we also have Ginger Gibson, who's in New York with me. Um, she's a former director of sales and marketing at the Millennium Times Hotels in Premier New York. Um, she is currently the senior lead consultant and advisory at the transportation, uh, Transformation Group. So today's webinar is brought to you by Merchant Advocate. I would like to introduce you to Michael Drinkus, who will briefly talk about their product and how they can assist hotels and restaurants and resorts in the post-pandemic future. Over to you, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you all for joining us here today. You know, as you, we all know, life is filled with certain uncertainties. And before all these uncertainties began, I had the opportunity to try something new, something challenging, something that was a little bit uncertain. And that was I got a chance to join my grandmother to play bingo. I'll tell you, I bit off a little bit more than I could chew because I like to think I'm pretty adept. I got the four boards. I thought I was pretty cool. I could barely keep up. I had the support of the old ladies next to me that were putting the dots on the numbers for me. I was almost in panic mode. And then I learned something I didn't expect. I learned how you make a 90-year-old woman blurt and explicative that would make most people blush. <laughs> you simply had another 90-year-old woman yell, bingo. It was quite pretty, uh, pretty enlightening to say the least and it's interesting because when i started with merchant advocate years ago i found a similar way to elicit the same sort of response from a cfo from a controller from a business owner from the director of finance and all you simply have to do is mention the words merchant services or credit card processing and there's this feeling of angst and frustration because it's an unregulated industry literally every time an organization goes to accept their funds via credit or debit transactions, they're losing money to these silent equity partners that are siphoning off funds. Now to add insult to injury, it doesn't even matter what sort of rates one signs up for because it's a moving target. The business owner or the CFO gets this confusing merchant statement that literally might as well be in a foreign language. And there's all these fees that don't really make sense. And because just because one signs up for certain pricing doesn't mean that that's the pricing they're going to maintain because rates go up three to four times per year. So what our organization does, what Merchant Advocate does, is we reel in that cost of credit card acceptance and we review, we actually, if we go to, to what we do, to our three-step process, we should have a slide come up in a moment, we literally analyze the existing state of a merchant account. And when I say analyze, our team doesn't just look at the processor markups, the unregulated processing industry markups. We also look at the interchange, the regulated side, that's the issuing cost, which accounts for about 70% of the cost of a transaction. And this is very important because processors do not, do not look at the interchange cost, the issuing side from Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover, but the same transaction can have four different tiers of pricing based upon coding and data flow which can vary by as much as one and a half percent. So our team, when we analyze an account, we focus on where the, where the transaction starts and we correct any coding and data flow, creating savings for our clients. And then we put the spotlight on the unregulated side, on that processor side, and we expose any hidden fees, exaggerated markups. It's ironic because we find these mathematical errors all the time that always seem to be in favor of the processor. And our team goes to work with your existing relationships to bring your cost down. The beauty of the program is there's no out-of-pocket expense. When we review an account, if we find that you're in good shape, well, you've just gotten professional validation regarding the health of your merchant services with no cost to you. 
if we look at an account and we identify savings opportunity, well, then we work with those existing relationships to lower your cost. We catch those revenue leaks and inject them right back into your bottom line. A little bit about the company, Merchant Advocate has been around for about 15 years now. We are the thought leaders in the merchant service space. Merchant Advocate was created to drive that fairness and transparency in the unregulated world of credit card processing. Again, we help you save money without you having to switch. We bring your costs down, we plug those revenue leaks, inject that revenue right back into your bottom line, and the only way we're compensated is by sharing in a portion of that success that we've created for you. Now, normally Merchant Advocate shares in 50% of the savings we create. However, because of our relationship with ILHA, for any attendees of this webinar, we've actually reduced that to 40%. And the way it works is our clients get 100% of the savings up front. It's proven out by a monthly savings analysis. And then only after the savings has been proven, do we remit back for our portion. We'd really love the opportunity to help your facilities, your organizations. We've helped multiple hotels, multiple, multiple clients across all industries, really. Love the opportunity to help you. During a follow-up email, you will have my contact information. You also have a link to a unique landing page for ILHA members, where you can go and input your information. All we really need is three months worth of merchant statements, and we're looking forward to help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. And, and for more information on Merchant Advocate, um, there is, and their assessment offer, there is a brochure that you can actually download in the control panel. Um, so this will be available during the duration of this uh, webinar, so don't forget to uh, download. So uh, let's start. Let's start with today's discussion. So um, let's ask the first question, which is, you know, about our global crisis and, you know, how can hotels and resort uh, pivot and what do we need to pivot um, to a more agile culture? So, you know, what should we be expecting to see and, and what are some of the tips and best practices that, you know, we have developed in our respective uh, hotels and, and, and areas? So who, who would like to take a, a start on this? Um, Jackie, would you like to start us off? Sure, happy to. Thanks, Bridget. Um, yeah, this is so big for the future of our organization. You know, we we love kind of pulling up last year's numbers, pulling up the PACE reports, sort of mapping where we are, and now we find ourselves in a situation that is just unlike anything we've seen before, where we're just crawling out of the end of travel. So given that, I think there's, um, you know, there's freedom in that. We're, we're used to working with metrics that are, that are commonly known, so um, at least in uh, our organization, Premier Worldwide Marketing, which is working with Charisma Hotels and Resorts, um, there have been really kind of two things that we've done. So one I would say is finding a way to get the smart people in the room virtually. So, you know, we always kind of tried to, you know, have some friends that you could stop by their office, brainstorm with. We've actually solidified those meetings and put a system behind it so that people are talking regularly from multiple disciplines. So, and I think it's really important. It's not just the creatives and the marketing people. We've got revenue in there. We've got all of our finance people in there. We've got HR. Like, it's, it's still a small group, but a group that is bringing a lot of different viewpoints. And I'm a big believer that the viewpoints kind of help you find the next idea. And then the next piece is um, really embracing this kind of A-B testing mindset for everything. Like, we don't know what's going to work. Uh, we wish we did, but all we can do is take an educated guess. So, um, so really setting that out from a leadership level, we know that not all of these ideas will work. Some of them will fail, but let's try the best ones that we can agree with internally and then pivot to, to you know, amp that up if it works. So those are kind of the two main principles that we're working from. And so far, we're, we're starting to see some positive success. Our Time to Rebook campaign um, got a, a significant jump for us. So uh, we're just trying to find what works like everybody else. I, I like the A-B testing for sure. In digital, yeah. we're all about A-T testing, you know, testing every little thing from text to colors to placements. Um, I like that. That's good. Gabriella, do you have anything you want to add from your perspective? Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm based in Italy, so it's kind of late, and I'm in the lobby of a hotel, so if there is any sound, I apologize. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I agree actually with Jacqueline because, you know, brainstorming, putting the minds together, I think it's that moment of time where all the hoteliers in the world are asking themselves the same questions, how to accurately, you know, and quickly um, uh, get the, the customer uh, demand change and how to better design the customer experience and appropriate one considering the safety measures. So obviously, uh, in these uncertain times, I think it's important that the hotel operators, they need to, they must master a competitive agility to bring back profitability and also the value that has been lost in the last month. So in this case, agility means they need to be ready, you know, to, um, uh, to uh, growth. Uh, to boost to boost to boost the growth and optimize you know costs and also to revise the um, uh, operational mode because a lot of it will be about cost at the in the in the next month um, due to the uh, to the travel restrictions and obviously the weak confidence of the customers um, they will need to find to, to come up with creative uh, solutions how to uh, engage with, with, with the guests and how to make them feel safe. And obviously this is not only a uh, one done activity only for uh, a revenue manager, it's a team effort. So I agree with Jacqueline, you need to put the minds together in a room, virtual room, because obviously we cannot stay together. And it's very easy because in the last months, what happened, we've seen many platforms putting for free a lot of online meetings, right? Like Google Meet, Zoom, and so on and so yeah. on. So it's just a question of getting into the habit to uh, get together and find the best solution and adjust because the market will keep changing. Yeah. Well, very true, very true. I mean, we've, uh, you know, some of the hotels has been closed for several months now and, 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 and some are, even though they're operating, but they're, they're slowly operating, not at the usual pace. So certainly anything we do or plan to do, we definitely need to work it a little faster than we used to, right? So that's where the agility culture would come in. And so agree with that. Ginger, any thoughts on your end? Oh, sorry, Ginger, I can't hear you. There, I think I'm oh, there you are. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, so just to reintroduce myself, I am uh, Ginger Gibson. I'm the Senior Lead Consultant and Task Force for Sales and Marketing at the Transformation Group. Um, so to answer the question, um, definitely we have to be thinking outside of the box now, especially in sales. And I think to be more agile is to be thinking differently uh, as well as moving quickly. Um, one of the things I think that's come of this downtime that all of us have experienced because of um, the fact that we're working from home, we've been furloughed and some of us, some, some have lost their jobs, is that it's a perfect opportunity to uh, train and get new education to be a better partner for your travel partners once things do start to ramp back up. Um, one example of this is Cvent, um, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with Cvent. Um, they are currently offering free training and certifications uh, opportunities for uh, event and hospitality professionals around the world. So I would think that during this new era, uh, education and guidance is the key. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to dive into learning where in the past maybe you just didn't have enough time. Um, smart sellers are taking the time to sharpen their skills um, and taking the opportunities while they're presented to us. So I think that's definitely key. Um, another thing is uh, when we talk about being agile, it's also about um, being flexible, understanding that right now we need to be flexible with our selling mindset um, as it relates to our top accounts. I think we've all experienced lately that we're getting a lot of connections on LinkedIn and the ones that we get where immediately we're getting a, an, a, a proposal and, and being asked to buy something during a pandemic where there's high unemployment probably isn't the way to go. Um, I would say that 
reaching out to your top clients and staying close to them, um, but not selling to them right now. Um, it's time to be empathetic, let them know that you're thinking about them, um, take the time to find out what's happening on their side. When are they planning to return to the office? Um, how many associates are going to be coming back when they do? And every uh, corporation is having to uh, rethink their floor plans uh, as it relates to social distancing. So they're probably going to be bringing in teams that are going to set up cubicles and have you know barriers between um, person to person. And this takes a, an entire team to come in. It's not something that's going to be done overnight. So by staying close to your top clients, you find out this information. And when they do have these projects, when they're going to be reopening, you're going to be top of mind. So being agile is, is also about being flexible with the way that we've always thought we need to approach our clients. We, right now is not the time to do the hard sell. Yeah. I can't agree more. And you know, to, to add of all to add to all your points too, I think it has to start from the top. I think um, you know, top executives and GMs and owners, I think they have to embrace the concept and the and the concept of agile leadership. You know, yeah. um one taking back, you know, taking one step back and, and reassessing and relooking at our processes, our standard procedures, and the different um brains and expertise that they have on hand, whether it's at the corporate office or at the hotel, and see how we've been, we were able to maximize and put those brains together, as Jacqueline would say. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's important that um, leaders show by example, you know, bringing people together, creating a more collaborative uh, culture, uh, creating a more encouraging creativity and flexibility. I think, I think if that culture can be adapted, um, I think pivoting to agile culture within that company or at that department or, or hotel will be a lot easier for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So, and you know, just, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say that's such a good point because I also think all this change is really uncomfortable. You know, it's, yeah. it's not, <laughs> yeah. nobody likes it. Like we're, we're all trying to do the best we can in a really weird place. So that leadership mandate to um, embrace the fact that we're all uncomfortable, we're all working quickly, we're trying new things. I think it's just so important and, um, and to get beyond the, you know, don't make it perfect, make it quick. Like, I don't wanna right. see the perfect report three weeks from now. I want to see how you're thinking right yeah. now. Let's talk about the bones of it and to make that the expectation when, when so many of us are used to you know, dotting every I and and making sure that what we send up the chain is just right and we just don't have that luxury anymore. So I just, I fully endorse that leadership mandate to, um, you know, just introduce the new normal and like, it's weird, but it's okay. Yeah, and, and you know, and also we don't, might, we might not have a full team, right? So we might not even have that kind of human capital and brain that we used to have. Um, and so therefore, we definitely need to take tally and capitalize and maximize the resources that we do have. And so, you know, that would mean bringing different people from different teams and different levels of management that we would never have in the past. Um, because good ideas can come from everywhere. Absolutely. And uh, hardworking people come from different levels of, of the organization. So. They come um, also for webinars like this, you know. I've never yeah. had many webinars, but really sharing insights and ideas. I get, I guess it's a worldwide brainstorming at this point, you know. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like this. It's just internationally. Everyone is facing the same challenges. Obviously, the the winners will be the ones that will will be quicker, right, and will yeah. be ready to adapt quicker yeah so that's the, the key lesson i think from the covid 19 outbreak it's true it's true um and this question is 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 uh for you gabrielle and ginger um how do you see sales manager and review management more collaborative and working better together in this new environment anyone can ginger, start do you want to start ginger <laughs> um 
so from a sales perspective, I I would say that they're already working better uh, with sales with our revenue managers. I mean, I think we've learned that this whole um, situation has been the great equalizer. Um, so we all agree that you know we want to find that business, and with within every crisis there is some opportunity that comes from it. And that's been true from 9-11 to 2007 when the stock market tumbles. Um, so we know that business we can count on right now um, in front of us is, you know, it's a lot of domestic. We've all lost the international tri traveler and that's not gonna be back until hopefully 2021. Um, but 100% of what we are getting is all driving in by car, possibly train. Um, so there's already um, a potential for us with that, but then there's also um, revenue and sales working together on the essential workers segmentation. And um, I'm sure everybody's aware of this, but there is a reference chart on state essential businesses uh, designated by state that you can find on the web. And each state, for example, California on um, that has 17 different um, industries that fall under essential workers. Um, so it's important that for revenue and sales that, you know, knowing that we can't look backward to look at data from last year or five years ago because it's irrelevant right now. We can't look forward to a demand calendar or to uh, different events that take some place, parades or whatever the case might be. So now we need to be on the same page. Um, even more so than we were before and just coming up with specific strategies towards each of those essential worker uh, industries that fall under that that listing and then sales taking and, and reaching out digitally or virtually to uh, to close it but it's important now it's more than ever that you know we're on the same page uh, and I believe that we are and we understand that you know we, we've really been reduced to a limited amount of, of segments that that are available to us to go after. So we have to be very precise and, and um, thoughtful. Um, I guess it, it used to be, you know, that um, this, this old story about sales and revenue that they have strong personalities and they never get along. I guess it, it's, you know, everyone was like when the sales and revenue used to be together in a room, everyone was like, hey, let's leave them and just let them figure out what's going on. <laughs> but um, in the last years, I think everything changed just yeah. because everyone is open-minded. And with the outbreak, I think the most important thing is not to forget that we are professionals. We, we like what we do. We have at heart our jobs and our company, right? It's our professionalism. Uh, so I guess it's, it's no longer that kind of situation. And when it comes to Nobu, I have to say that me and my uh, director of sales and marketing at Shoreditch, where I am in charge of, of, of revenue, we have regular catch-ups. And as long as we have a motivation, a strong motivation, it's uh, actually quite beneficial for both parties, you know, to have like an adult conversation, <laughs> let's call it like this, <laughs> we're no longer kids. And the situation is quite, you know, dramatic everywhere. So obviously uh, a dialogue is the first point of, uh, the, first, the first starting point, right, of anything, a, a good dialogue. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and we, like, like uh, Ginger said, what we do is the same old story. We go through the segmentation. We just monitor the market. Everyone knows that with the traveling restrictions, you need to look at the domestic market. And it is also, there are a lot of insights out there that they uh, expect to have, um, you know, more demand in le leisure destinations, which I can confirm this is what is going on at the moment. People are so sick to stay indoors right you can't anymore it's been four months physically I thank god i have beach resorts because <laughs> <laughs> that's why i left london <laughs> in Italy, they started to use the lockdown it was maniac to stay indoors so it was even a pleasure to speak with my 
my neighbor. <laughs> so, <laughs> hello, how are you? So yeah, just to, uh, I think Ginger is right. There is a dialogue and it needs to be constructive because we are professional, first of all, and all the things should be, uh, like I said, even before it's a team effort, they should come from a team effort. Everyone understands the moment, yeah. regardless of, of uh, uh, designation. <laughs> yeah, and if I could just piggyback on what Gabriella said, um, you know, I think absolutely it was a, a very well-known um, concept that there was a line between sales and revenue and there was a lot of friction um, sometimes you would not have that, but for the most part, it was a pretty well-known thing in the industry. But I think that um, obviously this event led us to the point where we don't have the luxury of having separate objectives, whether it's ADR and, um, you know, that we're going after, obviously ADR and WebCar, you know, we still look at those things, but at, at the current situation, we just want business. And, and there cannot be any any lines in the sand. There can't be any barriers on communication. We have to be on the same page, and uh, we we just don't have the luxury of of, of having any issues. Um, it's all about where where can we get this business, and how can we work together to come up with a, a race strategy to achieve um, getting the close on that business. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you both you both mentioned that because you know thinking with my analytical brain, my first thing is they just have to align their business objective. You know, I think we um, you know talking about breaking down the silo, um, we all want to get to the same end goal. Our approach mm -hmm. might be different because of our expertise and, and and our responsibility, but if our own business objectives are not even aligned um, with each other as department heads or with the GM or with the owner, then it can never work. And of course, there's always going to be battlefields and meeting rooms, you know, and I think um, I think that this time COVID is actually an opportunity for us to leverage this you know, sort of uh, situation where we can actually have the time, the patience, <laughs> you know, to collaborate and really talk things through. Like you said, I completely agree. It's about the survival of, of our industry at this point. So patience is, you know, it's a whole other thing. This is a this is right. a battle for survival right now. Yeah. We all have to be aligned. Well, at least we all have that objective, right? Yeah. <laughs> right we all agree on that objective. So. Yeah. so, you know, shifting gear a little bit to, to digital, um, you know, and about digital transformation. It is relatively a new word. It's been around for a few years and, you know, people are overusing it, I think, you know, just like data, AI, you know, those words have been, been around, but there is a misconception about what digital is and, and digital transformation. You know, a lot of times people think I'm an IT person and I can fix their phone line or, or their cable and, you know, and, and, and that, that wouldn't be me. Um, <laughs> You know, and and a lot of times when I speak to um, owners and executives, they think that digital transformation means I want them to buy technology. You know, and and it's not about that. Really, you know, digital transformation is not just about technology investment. It really refers to the way organization and hotels and resorts. Uh, sees ways where they can restructure themselves to adapt and to alter their company culture to embrace innovation. And those innovations typically do leverage technology, you know, and so, and so there will be some technology in, uh, investment, but it's really about empowering the team, your own mind, to be open to innovate, to grow your business to the next level and not just doing status quo or what you have been doing. So with this COVID, you know, we have, as an industry, we have been forced, you know, we've just been hit in the face with this and we, we are, we have to adapt to the new innovation um, and to certain technologies that we're not familiar with, you know, how we even operate a hotel and how we service our guests is completely different. Um, you know, but what I hope is that these are not just um, immediate solution to a current problem. I really hope that our industry will look at this, you know, and our thought leaders 
will look at this as an opportunity, as a springboard, you know, as a jumpstart to think about how they how they can continuously improve on the guest services, you know, continuously and seamlessly improve communication, not just with the outside guests or press or industry contacts, but within themselves. I mean, I don't think um, every hotel in the world right now has a internal communication solution. You know, how is the um, housekeeper speaking to the front desk without picking up the phone? Like these are the kind of things that we actually have to think about now because of all this contact list and all this social distancing. So, you know, some of the technologies that are flying off the shelf and obviously the contactless technology like the the keyless entries right everyone seems to be buying that up um which from a digital standpoint i'm really happy about that because you know what luxury really means forget about covid we have tech, tech, technology luxury to me is really about providing the option you know luxury is having that option and that flexibility you want to provide every possible option to your guests without them asking. If they don't want to come to the front desk and talk to you, they shouldn't have to, and they shouldn't have to ask you for it, right? If they are worried about touching their keys because of germs, and definitely now very much germs, they shouldn't have to ask. And for those who are afraid of technology, then you, know, you can still give them the key if you want to. But it's really about leveraging digital transformation and digital in, in general is really about servicing your luxury clients and guests with that option and that's what luxury really means um and and some of the areas that we should all think of as an industry and as um uh thought leaders in in, in this industry go beyond the operations you know the contact list the, the communication apps um think about data you know these are kind of things that uh, I've been preaching for a really long time, but it's not just about collecting data, but it's about collecting the right data, you know, and keeping it clean and protecting it and analyzing it. I, I know that a lot of hotels cannot afford an analyst uh, or a data scientist, but we need to learn the skills because we could have an abundance of data and it's just sitting there. We're not using it properly. We're not using it at all, you know, are we using it to service, to personalize, to better advertise, to cut costs, to cut you know resources, or to to streamline um, you know uh, processes? Not really. Some are doing better than others, but I don't think as an industry as a whole we know how to leverage data to really help us drive our business better. Um, I think another area that digital transformation can can transform hotel business and industry is is levering digital for communication, um, for push marketing. You know, we're very good at buying ads. We're very good at sending emails. We got banners, we got website. But are we really speaking to our clients and guests when they want us to, when they want to speak to us? You know, is it relevant, whether it's geography or time or preference? You know, one of the things that um, I know at Nobu, uh, we're launching is the Wi-Fi marketing and basically every hotel now we offer Wi-Fi but besides just offering this Wi-Fi as a service as a hotel and resort how can you leverage that when someone logs into your Wi-Fi there's a, an abundance bottomless amount of data you're collecting on this individual and every time this person comes back whether it's an overseas uh, guest or one that lives down the street and just comes to your restaurant and bars for drinks and restaurant you can leverage that wi-fi to understand this guest better um, and to service him and to recognize this person better another area that i i haven't really seen much of um, is an ai technology empowered website um, i know at, at nobu we, we recently launched a website um, on the surface, it looks like any other website, you know, because we can't make it too fancy because then people don't know how to use it. So it has to be user friendly, of course. But on the back end, it's actually layered with 47 new technology and functionalities that you would never know as a, as a user. So one of the big um, feature about the Nobu website is over time, and I've spoken about this in, in 
previous presentations also before, over time, this website will recognize you, understands exactly what you like, and just gives you the relevant recommendations and pages. So if Gabrielle and I both look at the Nobu site, I like food and she likes spa, no longer will we both get the homepage. The hope is irrelevant. She doesn't want to dig through the website to find what she's interested in. The spa will be her page and my restaurant would be my page. And that's the kind of thing that we need to do um, in terms of digital because only can we leverage all these technology and data that's in front of us can we propel our business and the industry forward. Um, so cool. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> so in your area, <laughs> this is my favorite topic, you know, in your area, how have you seen digital been used, especially now with COVID? I'm sure all of us is adapting to digital to some part, more so than before. So um, I'll start with you, Jacqueline. You know, how have you been using digital um, to help PR, branding, and communication? Sure. Um, well, the, the top of mind example is um, safety and sanitation, right? So many people in our industry are developing programs there. So of course, like, looping in QR codes for restaurant menus to minimize, you know, paper menus, things like um, amping up the speed at which we'll have contactless entry, things like that. That's all a big piece. But then um, I always, I, I'm always so interested in where technology intersects with actual communications and guest experience too. So that's also where we've seen a major shift to everyone is living their lives online, you know? So all of a sudden, like it wasn't important before, our website is crucial. And, and we find that, you know, it's kind of the same experience for multiple brands. And I have really different brands, like the Nickelodeon Hotel is way different than the new Margaritaville Island Reserve. Like we've got to figure out a way to make that more distinctive. Um, but then it's also been cool to see the way just all of our lives have turned digital. So the chance to like tell more stories on social media, Early in the pandemic, we saw a 40% increase in people's usage of basic social media. So we were there. We just started sharing stories and saw incredible engagement from that. So, so uh, I tend to simplify it a little bit of just how do I connect with my guests through all the channels available, and that is all digital everywhere you go. So, um, so it's really fun to think about how it becomes more interconnected and, and more personalized and more of a storytelling vehicle too. Do you see you continue using digital, you know, or and, and adapting more digital efforts in your area? Yeah, definitely. I, I think that the technology is key um, for the guest experience on property, just to make it smoother, easier, simple check-in, you know, even temperature scans, like that is part of our reality and we need to make it on intrusive. But then also, um, you know, I'm, I'm less concerned about the big glossy PR hit in terms of a tangible thing. It's more about how can I share an accolade on our website? I mean, that's where everything becomes content. So once you can think of all of these pieces just becoming digital bits of content, then you can really start to have fun with it and say, how do I, how do I share that? And like you were saying, I think finding the tech to make it more and more relevant is, is maybe the path forward. Ginger, do you want to add on from your perspective, sales and digital? Absolutely. So um, digital definitely is, the, is now the way that we are even more so reaching our end user. Um, retail is the segmentation that we're selling. I don't know, I'm getting some feedback from somebody. Um, I don't think I can hear that. Really. Oh, yeah, the echo. Yeah, um, but overall, I think one of the biggest things, uh, one of the biggest opportunities that um, have presented itself because of, of what has occurred, it's kind of um, you know a negative, but it also has a positive, and that is that the traditional way of doing sales um, has been shaken up. Um, their sales is direct selling is always going to be important. Having that human relationship is always going to be important. But um, right now, I think that 
people obviously are afraid to even go look at an apartment before they rent it. So they're doing virtual tours of apartments. So I believe that obviously that some of the main things that we do as sellers, like health, uh, site tours and entertainment and visiting clients in their offices, these are things that are going to be gone for some time. And that in mind, it's important that a couple of things um, are happening. Number one, our websites, you know, before I think uh, there might have been some hesitation um, by some owners and, and operators to spend the money that was needed to really make their website a wow factor because this is the first impression that the customer is getting when they're taking a look at your hotel. And uh, now, because they're not able to come in and do a full site tour of the hotels, um, we need to make that more of an experiential uh, situation scenario for them so that you know they're getting a 360 kind of experience um, you know, as if they were walking through the hotel themselves. Um, it's very important, and I'm sure that there are hotels that have already put that together at, a long time ago, but now is the time to invest in that. Um, static photos just aren't going to cut it anymore, and um, digital is the way that we're reaching our consumers. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, now is the time to be gathering information, finding opportunities, and empathizing with the clients but the way that we're going to be able to show our new clients what we're all about, it's got to be about that virtual reality experience. And again, that's technology that's been around for a very long time. We may not have thought that we absolutely needed to do it a year ago, but now the time has changed. And uh, if you're not investing in that, I think that uh, um, it's definitely going to be a detriment. And, you know, I'm glad you mentioned website because that is something that's been around for a long time now, even pre-COVID. But I'm hoping, and, and what you're mentioning is exactly um, the thought about website is I'm hoping that this crisis will make us revisit our thoughts and our website because it shouldn't be a brochure of static photos and content and you only change it up once a year, you know or when you have another photo shoot, um, it, it really should be a live virtual hotel. So as a salesperson, it should be an extension of you. It should be your sales tool. As a PR communication brand person, it really should be speaking for you. And you know, same with revenue. I, I think it, you know, it shouldn't be a static photo of, of a room. Like every room, every luxury hotel room has marble floors and you know, a marble bathrooms. And, you know, but what makes it unique, like, you know, little, uh, I think videos in booking engines would definitely sell your room. And, and these are the kind of things I think we have to revisit when we look at our websites. You want yeah. to add to the, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna quickly say, I mean, in, in putting together these 360 videos, um, virtual reality videos, I mean, we can include the entire executive team on those and just have a yeah. warm, sense of arrival from the curb in the neighborhood all the yeah. way through. So it's definitely, uh, as you mentioned, uh, an extension of, of the sales department, given that we're not going to be able to do these site tours. Right. Um, Any thoughts from you, Gabrielle, on the revenue and distribution side? Uh, I, I, I cannot stay silent, right? <laughs> <You know. laughs> so, you know, it's very funny, but um, like you said at the beginning, hoteliers, uh, uh, maybe they were a little bit resilient about when it comes to digital. And with COVID-19, they are forced to actually uh, be more agile, right? Digital is part of the agility at the end of the day. And we've seen it just now because uh, at the beginning, uh, the first one to look into digital were the OTAs and the hotelier were kind of ignoring that part, thinking, OK, yeah, fine, we have other things to do. And they were handing over all their inventory, availability, visibility and so on. Obviously, when they come up with a very uh, big production and big numbers in terms of commission, hotelier were starting to be interested into digital. We're, we weren't just yet at, at their level, obviously, and we're still struggling because when it comes to Google campaigns or they are definitely the masters, right? 
their business comes from online sales. So we yeah. should learn from that. We shouldn't go into conflict with them. We just need to spy. I call it let's spy. And let's take a little bit of that kind of um, philosophy and implement it across all departments. Um, if we were to invest the same amount that we pay annually for commissions, we would definitely have a better return of investment when it comes to conversion. So my advice to Hotelier is take the direct business and see how much you spent on it. Then compare it to the OTAs, compare it to the commission that you paid for, and then try to figure out by yourself why you should invest more in your direct business by investing in good digital marketing tools and trust more the expertise when it comes to that. As a revenue, I'm always interested what's going on. And you know, Bridget, I don't have a good knowledge, but I'm like, I like to ask questions and yes. you never know. Yes, yes, you have question. Yeah, I'm yes. always asking even silly questions. I because love it. It's, yeah. it's, Stay it's curious, the right? Yeah. Yeah. The to learn, right? And recently we implemented um, a payment gateway. It sounds silly, but it's an instru it's amazing because with just, you know, your mobile, you can pay everything with one go. That's easing the process of conversion. People don't have time to go and collect their credit card and just input the 16 digits. Yes, it's secure, it's safe, but it's safe also on an online platform. If you give these tools, to someone, I'm sure even the process of conversion will be different. So whatever it was done on the OTA's platform, we need to copy it. We need yeah. to copy it and now we are forced to do it because yeah. some of, of, of our customers will be the ones to prefer to, to be more contactless and you know touchless. And we need to give yeah. that option because we are luxury. And even That's if you're not luxury, we need to be we need to offer safety and secure ways uh, and protect our business uh, nowadays. And it's going to happen even in two years' time from now on. Everything will change. And I'm glad because it was yeah. difficult to explain to people how important <laughs> it, it yeah. was, you know, to implement these things. It wasn't only just, I want to be cool and I want to have the technology. It's just give another option and extend your op uh, your opportunities to reach, you know, different markets. So, yeah, I agree. Digital is, is, is the agility. Yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah. say. Very, very true in, in, in all, all of our areas. I think digital, I mean, for so long, we've left so much money on the table because we're not investing in our own digital. And OTA is taking up more and more of our of our business because they are, you know, and um, and so I, I think I think I'm really glad that you guys have um, payment gateway. You know, I think not every hotel, in fact, I think very small number of hotel brands actually have virtual wallets. So now, you know, there's that's a percentage of customers you're not going to get. You know, those are the guests who wants to pay with their phone and they can't because you don't have. Um, iPhone Pay or you know Apple Pay or Samsung. So yeah. good for you. Now talking about revenue, um, how do you think we can generate hotel revenue by the time we reopen and fully reopen? Um, we, we are generating um, revenue because we need to look at the costs, right? So we will start with the core values. What is our financial goal? That's the first line. <laughs> and in, in the new scenario, everything has been rescheduled, replanned, reviewed, because obviously nothing is going to be for in the next six to 12 months as it used to be in you know pre-COVID. So to start with, I think what we do at Nobu, we look at, um, at costs what exactly we can improve and how can we enhance, you know, our um, operational, operational uh, workload? How can you, um, um, you know, optimize with less, less stuff? Because unfortunately, this is a reality. Uh, a lot of companies have been through redundancy process. And obviously, 
uh, uh, to keep everyone, you need to have the cash flow. By that time, you need to look at the cost. And I think that's one of the things to, 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 to help generate the profit. Then another thing will be dynamic pricing. You can't have just a fixed price. You need to be flexible. And uh, not, it's not reducing the rate, it's just, you know, look what's going on in the market, what exactly your competitors are doing. And uh, you can actually come up with add values, you know, uh, packages. This is another way to make money in the in the short term. People will at the end of the of the of the pandemic will feel like I want to celebrate. What let's think about it. Everyone will, will have a good reason to celebrate, right? I want to see my I want to see my colleagues, my mates. I want to go out and have 10 pints of beer. Yeah, it's a lot. Well, I do. So just think about it. What would you think that right? Bottomless french fries for whoever <laughs> takes 10 pints of beer you know it's like this you need to be creative and rather than discounting offer value i think that's that's a key uh, that's the key to a successful you know business in the future and it it will not um reduce your 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 offering because the, the guests were a you know, accustomed to a, diff to, a, to a certain level. You cannot lower that level just because you, you want to reduce your cost. So obviously you need to compensate here and there and try to optimize your costs and that will help in the short term. Then the whole industry will recover at some point. We all want to travel again. So even if, if they say, who knows if the industry will go back? Yes, it will. Maybe some segments will, 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 will develop a different you know, um, way of operating, but they will still travel. They will, people will always travel. They discovered the world in the last 10 years. I don't think there will be anything in between them and you know, meeting the world <laughs> so <laughs> no outbreak can actually stop our will to, to to meet other culture and to mix with other cultures so it's yeah. just we need to be to play it smart monitor analyze share insights with everyone including competitors business partners because everyone is in the same situation no one is an enemy so i think yeah, this is how you operate. You just play it smartly at the cost level and keep it smart with your, you know, whatever you can offer and tailor made as much as possible because the customer experience, you shouldn't, it, sh it shouldn't be affected. It shouldn't. Yeah. Agreed. So. And, you know, Jacqueline, um, Gabriela touched on tailor made creativity. How do you think we can still foster creativity? Yeah, I think it, it requires a conscious effort because we're we're all so, um, you know, we're stressed. We're, I, I find actually a lot of people in hospitality are working even longer hours than before. So um, there's a lot of reading. There's kind of um, borrowing from some good ideas. And I just kind of go back to, I think all of us have um, a network. We have experiences. We have a lot of um, contacts with, with new ideas in our lives if we really think about it. So, um, you know, one of the things that we're doing over at Charisma is um, a private jet partnership, which came out of, I was consulting for a private jet company going like, hey, maybe people don't want to deal with the whole commercial flight yeah. thing, but they still want their vacation. And that's, Boy, you yeah. know, that was just my connection. But we explored it. The rest of the team was like, yeah, maybe let's try it. I still don't know that it will be a big money maker. But those are the things that I think we have an obligation to each think of. And, and that's what I'd go back to everybody on the call of you all have those experiences. You have those networks. You have the neighbor. You have, you know, the, you know, the great chocolatier down the road. Um, what are those pieces that you could bring to the table and activate like tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and that um, the empowerment to think about, oh, just my contacts could actually help make a difference for for the larger company. I think it's it's just a mentality shift and it's all on the table. And I think we need to be thinking about it in terms of like, there's some big ideas that are kind of fun, but then there's also the tried and true that we can improve. How do we do that? And how do we yeah. sort of 
separate out these tiers of creativity so that we're still focusing on what makes money, but then we're getting people's attention and driving excitement as well. So, um, yeah. but we, we think about it every day. I don't think anyone fully has it figured out yet, but it's yeah. part of what's exciting right now. It's true, and I, and I think you probably need more creativity now than ever before right because it's not like yeah. uh, we've all experienced a pandemic before <laughs> so there's really no rule book so we do have to uh embrace this whole out of you know out of the box thinking um and i think what's important too is be a little risk taking i mean it's so yeah. easy to follow the template of you know the protocol this is what we've been doing this is how we have to do it we can only do this we, but it's not that kind of world anymore. We what we were doing before, we not necessarily can do it now. So I think having um, managers and leaders in the culture that said it's okay to take a little risk because we don't know. Like you said at the very early, we don't know if it's going to work. But if you don't try and if you're not creative about it, you know, with your approach and your ideas, um, I think the other thing is, and this will probably touch on uh, what Ginger's thinking is like emotional selling. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a human event globally, and you can't deny it. Um, you kind of have to be human. Your brain, your you have to humanize your brand. Your brand can't be an entity that stands there and waits, right? You have to embrace and you have to speak to the individual. So, you know, I think more emotional selling than ever before, even though we have been with our videos and our ads and this, but more so now than ever because everyone is going through it and it's yeah. um you know and it's such a traumatic time for everybody around the world yeah any other thoughts on that before uh, uh so um one of the questions that that came through is uh how do you think we can teach our teams whether it's a uh, hotel you know hotel uh teams or executive team to be more collaborative and to be more agile what, agile so how do you think we can teach these skills or or uh or thinking or, ment or mentality and you want to take a stab at it <laughs> i don't know that uh you know i think everybody's learning agility as we go along right now you know we we have no choice if uh it is we've lost all of the traditional channels of business um you know, we're all scrambling to try to make sense of what's been been happening, and uh, it's we've been learning to be more agile because we're part of it. It's it's not something you you have a choice in the matter of. I, I don't believe so. I mean, if anybody wants to resist that, I mean, obviously those are the ones that are going to be unsuccessful. Your 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 hotels are not going to be succeeding once even getting through this part. But I, I think that we're all learning to be more and more agile as we go through this. Yeah, true. Yeah. And I think it's it's helped us just throwing some meetings on, you know, where um, we're going to meet three times a week and we're going to talk it through. And uh, and that's caught that's forced, you know, that's forced us to learn things where brand is saying that doesn't feel right to us. But revenue saying, you know, we but we need the money. And, it, you know, like it's just yeah. this combination where um, distribution's going like great idea. I needed it three weeks ago. Like so we're just finding this new way of um, moving faster than we ever have before, but finding sort of what the what the absolute dependencies are. So it's been a little bit trial and error, but just getting the right people talking has been key for us. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we all agree that this global crisis has turned our industry and our lives upside down. So, you know, but we we must embrace this, this situation and, and transform this disruption into an opportunity. I think um, business agility will provide stability and it will allow us to navigate the unknown going forward. Um, I think to truly transform our hotels and resorts, we need to replace the mindset. And I think we all agree um, on this panel that we remove the mindset of a silo, um, solo contributor and, you know, and bring in more cross-functional team collaboration and adaptive leadership um, and thinking. Um, before I close, is there any last comment anybody want to make? 
Well, thank you guys all very much. I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, I also want to thank everyone for joining um, in today's uh, webinar. Um, don't forget, if you have not downloaded the Merchant Advocate or the Transformation Group uh, deck, please don't forget to download it in the little notes section of your control panel. Um, additionally, um, this is a recording uh, of the recording for this webinar and all our past webinar and future webinar will be on the website luxuryhotelassociation.org and you'll find it under the events. Um, our next webinar is going to be the future of hotel design. So it's going to be on August 12th, uh, 4 o'clock Eastern time. So we encourage you to join. Uh, ILHA and connect with all the hoteliers and leaders in the industry and stay on top of trends and grow your business. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.